everybody from a very sunny uh, London this morning and welcome to our webinar this morning, which is all about unlocking insight from data to support decision making. I'm Siobhan Benita, I'm a former UK senior civil servant, and I'm delighted to be chairing this webinar on behalf of Global Government Forum, which is a publishing house that serves civil servants all around the world, and also in partnership with our knowledge partner today, which is SAS. So in terms of our topic today, government collects lots and lots of data, but it's safe to say, I think, that it's currently not making the best use of that data to inform its own kind of operations, but also ultimately the delivery of services to the public. So in this webinar, we've got three fantastic speakers and we're we'll gonna be discussing the types of things like how is government using data to develop better targeted and personalized services? What are the initiatives in place to help them do that? How can data be used to evaluate government delivery and improve services? And how can we join up the data that is held across all of our government departments and our agencies to help make that process uh, more efficient? Um, I've got three fantastic speakers with us, as I've said, and in a moment, I'm gonna introduce each of our speakers and ask them to give some opening remarks. Um, but we will have lots of time after you've heard from our speakers to take questions from you, our audience. So on whichever device you are using, you should be able to see somewhere on your screen a Q&A function. Please use that Q&A function at any time from now onwards to message in any of your questions or your comments. Um, and we will get through as many of those as we can before the end of the webinar. And we've got great speakers, so please do take this opportunity to put your questions to them. So in terms of our speakers, first we will hear from Sarah Dini, who is Deputy Director for the National Hazard Assessment and Analysis Team, um, which sits in the UK Health Security Agency. And Sarah leads a division providing assessment and analysis supporting decision making on health security. Sarah joined the UK HSA from the Health Foundation, which was a health funder and think tank, where she worked to establish their data and analytical capacity and delivered a programme of analytical products that shaped decision making around health policy at the national level. Then we'll hear from Caroline Payne, who is Data and Analytics Director for Public Sector Northern Europe with our knowledge partner SAS. And having spent most of her professional life working with data and numbers, Caroline has worked at SAS for over 20 years, helping organisations across all sectors to gain intelligence from the vast source of data that they hold, and then to deploy these insights to help make the world a better place. Caroline leads a team of domain and technical experts who work with public sector organisations in the UK and the Nordics, and advises government agencies on the use of technologies, including AI, to drive better service delivery and outcomes for all citizens. And then finally, so last but by no means least, we'll hear from Emma Highland, who is Head of Data and MI at the Data and Analysis Team in the Illegal Migration Operations Command at the Home Office, where she's focused on how to deliver services that drive data-informed decision-making, positioning data as a real strategic asset. She's interested in the foundational building blocks of data capabilities and has a background in data quality strategy in particular, her focus being on how to implement strategies throughout the organisation and improve, ultimately improve service delivery for customers. So I'm sure you'll agree with me, as I said, we do have a fantastic panel, three great speakers. Please do take this opportunity this morning to put any of the questions that you have uh, to our speakers. But without further ado, I'm going to invite Sarah to give us some opening remarks. So coming over to you, Sarah. Thanks very much, Siobhan. And I'm so pleased to be able to speak about the work that we've done in UK HSA to help uh, protect the health of the public using data science and the vast wealth of uh, data that we hold in UK HSA and across the health system. And what I wanted to talk to you today was some key learnings that we had around particularly how understanding the needs of the end user and decision makers backed up by a strong data value chain really allows advanced data science methods to shine and add real value to health and to public services more broadly. Um, so what we learned in UKHSA, and I'm sure this will have resonance in many 
uh, areas of public services and wider is that while decision makers definitely need to know what's going on, so we need good data streams to say, to give situational awareness, they also want to know what is likely to happen in the future. Um, so to make sure that the policies are setting us in the right direction and to course correct if we need to. So that responsiveness is something that we're seeing growing demand for. Um, and as our forecasting capabilities and data science capabilities grow, it's something that we are learning to respond to. Um, and I probably don't need to say to this audience that, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic really amped up the demand and need for those kind of services in health. Um, so I, I'm not going to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to talk about what's happened over the last couple of winters where we've really reaped the benefits of the investments that we've had in our advanced methods. And so over the last couple of winters, there's been a real need from our very senior leaders in health, so from the Secretary of State and senior leaders in the NHS, to accurately forecast hospital admissions from a variety of different diseases. Because, of course, what you'll all have experienced over the last few winters, hopefully not too bad for yourselves, but that all the bugs that went away to a certain extent during COVID, so flu and RSV, have come back with a vengeance. And that's added complexity to decision making because now there's multiple threats to the system, although thankfully, obviously not on the same scale as during the height of the pandemic. And so in situations of this complex increasing demand, NHS leaders and the Secretary of State and others across the health system need to be able to know what is going to happen over the next few weeks. So if needed, they can share the burden across a region and um, maintain quality of care, perhaps in one hospital um, and take action um, across the social care or other areas of civil society. Um, and so then at a basic level to inform these decisions, they need to, to have our data um, and have forecasts that will tell them how many patients are likely to come to a given hospital in a given region. Is this within their planning um, uh, planning uh, parameters? Um, and then importantly as well, when is something going to de-escalate? When can they resume normal care? And as I said at the start, one of the key things that we learned that I'd like to touch on before I talk about the data science methods was the importance of really understanding the user need. Um, because while there was clearly a desire to forecast as long as possible ahead, um, as you'll know, the more you forecast ahead, it doesn't matter how much, how good your data science methods are, it will be more uncertain. And so it was really important for us to work with the stakeholders and users to understand the tension between having more certainty closer to home um, or closer in time versus more uncertainty further ahead. Um, and we could also then really focus down on forecasting what were the real metrics of interest, um, which was, of course, uh, important to the users. And so that meant that we could really focus on, in this case, admissions and occupancy for respiratory viruses, um, which create particular demand over the peak winter period. And having that information meant that we could really focus our data products and our data science products um, um, and ensure that we could um, bring those together in a way that would be likely to have most value. So then what we did um, was we created a suite of models which have used leading indicators. So that is taking the multiple data streams that we have in UK HSA and externally as well. So information that comes from the NHS, uh, Google data, testing data. So obviously multiple streams that would be very difficult for any decision maker to actually look across all of them in one go. We need to make their life easy. We need to uh, we need to do the work so they can make the decisions. Um, and so therefore, these technically advanced models were able to bring all this information together and forecast what was likely to happen over the next two weeks for different respiratory viruses. Um, and we also needed to be operationally really efficient. And this is where having a really efficient and uh, slick working data value chain comes in. So your data engineering has to be on point. Um, you need to have a really efficiently running system and a team that can work together because we can't have an off week essentially oh. over the winter period. Um, but our teams need to rest and have resilience. So we need to have a team that can work together to provide that seamless service during the peak winter period. So over the past year, um, because we had that all in place, we we're able to deliver a total of 92 forecasts across six metrics. Um, and for each, and this is where we get complex, for each of the different viruses we looked at, we had up to five models. So we were always able to provide the most accurate forecast. Um, but we could only do that because we had a really efficient system. Um, uh, otherwise, it really wouldn't have been good enough value for the public if we didn't have that efficiency brought in. 
Um, and we also then nested those forecasts within the wider data streams that we have in UK HSA and used intelligence and assessment methods to make a judgment. And that's really important for our stakeholders because they need to know the so what. We need to be able to say to them, this is what we think the impact is. And this is how sure we are of that outcome and then change that over time as we need to. So we can really guide our decision makers through the winter process um, and keep them confident that if we are unsure of something, we will communicate that well. And they know it's a dreadful term that we use, but how low bearing um, this forecast is on their decisions. Um, and so um, we were really happy with how this worked um, over the past couple of winters. We really do think from speaking to international colleagues that we have a product that really can, can hold its head up high internationally here. And we really learned that bringing all those elements together was essential. Just one of those wouldn't have worked. Um, having the most advanced methods doesn't matter if you don't know what your users need. Um, but we were really able to influence um, and help our decision makers from the Secretary of State down to the regional teams in the NHS understand what was needed um, and, and allow them to provide really good quality of care, despite the massive demand on services that we get each winter. And it doesn't mitigate those challenges, of course, but um, it did help them make better decisions in the moment. Um, so I'm really uh, happy to answer any questions that you have about that. And I'll hand over to Siobhan now. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. Great way to start. I think you've highlighted lots of points that we'll come back to in our conversation, but really interesting to hear about the work that you guys do and how you kind of moved into that forecasting space, really helping decision makers. But come, some of the key things that I pick up there, as you said, really having to understand the user needs. What are the real metrics that are going to be of most value to them and most interest to them? Is that whether it's timeliness, whether it's, the, you know, which policy decisions are they going to be using uh, this data to inform what's going to be of most value to them. Um, as you say, the confidence in your forecast being really, really important. So using various models, using that kind of wider data that you have to make judgments, making sure that you keep that confidence in what you're uh, delivering. And then also the importance of the efficiency and the resilience of your team that are doing all of this so that you can make sure that you can provide that service um, at the best, uh, you know, when it's needed most. And also how, how you bring together all those multiple streams of data, which I think is something that officials are struggling with, is how do they kind of manage their way through all of this data and you're making life easier for them by doing a lot of that work for them. Thanks so much, Sarah. Great way to start. We've already got questions coming in, so I can see that you've piqued a lot of people's uh, interest already. Caroline, coming over to you now. OK, thanks very much. Bon morning, everybody. Um, again, it's a sunny day here in, in Marlow. Delighted to be um, joining in this discussion. Um, as Siobhan said at the beginning, I'm Caroline Payne, and I've spent all my working life um, in the data and analytics space. And that, that started back before data science, machine learning, let alone AI or business topics. Um, I have spent quite a long time in the commercial sector, um, moved over to the, the public sector about six years ago. And, and there are a number of learnings um, that I think that you know we're, we're starting to see come in and, and, and sharing of ideas between the public and private sector. Um, so I'm from SAS. What, what does SAS do? Well, it, I guess in, in, in simple terms, we use technology and expert services to help organizations, as I said, both in the public and private sector, make sense of the data that they have. And that's that's really regardless of the type of data. I think that's that, that, that that's quite an important thing. You know, historically, that data has always been quite structured data formats. What we're now seeing is an explosion in unstructured data, be that text, images, videos, et cetera. And then, and then using this, this data, organizations can start to derive insights. They can essentially they can join the dots and see patterns in the data. And I think, you know, we, we just touched, we had Sarah touch on sort of data, data volumes. And I think what what we see is that. Often um, the organizations that we work with just can't identify the trends that they're looking for um, or the patterns in the data because they're not sort of spottable more to the to the human eye. Um, so doing that on a, 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 a level of scale, what, what, what does that mean? Well, really, it means organizations can make or well, they gain more accurate insights, which means that they can make more informed decisions, be those decisions 
by a human, or increasingly we're seeing that piece around automated decision making. So we hear pretty much every day that AI, artificial intelligence, can automate human tasks. And, and more recently, generative AI has burst onto the scene where we're hearing about the generation of synthetic data based on patterns that can be learned from existing data. data. But I, I think the other thing to say is that for, for some of the organizations that we get, engage with, that's, that's the vision of where they want to get to, but it's quite a big step. Um, and, and it's not where they, where they are today. Sometimes the, the, the needs and the priorities are simpler they need to get some of that insight before they can start to get to the, the foresight, the prediction, the forecasting that, that Sarah referred to. And I, you know, I'm a real advocate of saying that the kind of use of data, the types of applications, the sophistication of techniques and the automation, it's a journey. Um, and the important thing is to start on that, that journey. And I think sometimes we we do see things that are a catalyst to that journey. And, and, and no surprise, because it's already been mentioned that we saw COVID or the, the lockdown period of COVID as being a real catalyst for change. I think some of the, the hesitancy about, you know, ways of working and interacting with data, we, we did see a rapid move from we can't work like that to right, we've got problems to solve, we've got to keep operations running how do we do this in a safe and secure way and do it quickly and I think one one example that we saw was with um, HMRC and the, the furlough schemes so anybody that knows SAS may know that we're a key component in HMRC's connect system that's the that's a system that provides all the risking um, capabilities around tax compliance um, so when the job retention scheme was was announced, simply put, HMRC put that scheme into reverse so that they could ingest data from businesses, be they you know large enterprises or SMEs, so that they could collect that data to make the, the furlough data. Um, you know, and that involved bringing the data together, data, some data sharing across the public and the private sector, cross-referencing with third party data and data from other other government departments and that first data in ingestion happened just under three weeks from the from the scheme being announced super impressive and a lot of it was to do with very long hours that people worked but th th there's kind of another reason why it was able to happen so quick quickly and I think the couple of questions that I've already seen pop in reference that and that's to do with data data governance for HMRC that data government governance was already in place so it meant that those bilateral flows of data could happen quickly but with the confidence that the foundations were in there to protect that data to capture that data so that HMRC could provi provide the sorry the analysis that they needed to do at the time but also retrospectively they could go and do those checks to validate whether erroneous payments may have been made obviously the most important thing is because they were able to do it quickly those furlough payments were issued to the people that needed them really quickly i think so i guess the other thing just to to touch on on the on the, on the topic of data we did some research a couple of years ago and there was some really there was some good findings and some really positive findings so about just over two thirds of all responders, um, and these responders were from 11 central government departments. Those two thirds of responders said that their department was already collaborating and sharing data with other government organizations. And I think this is something that, you know, we see as SAS, we see uh, how invaluable that yeah. is in building that richness of, of data, be it to provide better services, for citizens or perhaps to protect against fraud, waste and abuse. And again, having the right data governance in place is, is key. And the other good news is that 90% of responders said that their organisation uses data to drive decision making. 
you know, to, to use the vernacular, if you like, from the webinar, they're already unlocking the data for insight. Um, they're on that journey that I referenced um, at, at, at the start. Um, and actually, we're in the process of refreshing that research, which I'm really excited about, because now we'll be able to see, or through the course of the summer, we'll be able to see um, what progress has been made, because it wasn't all fantastic news, what progress has, has been made, um, you know, what are the trends that we've seen? So, you know, we can make that report available to you once, once it's there. I think the, the other thing that the report referenced was that there are barriers, and I know we're going to come on to this, you know, some barriers, barriers around legacy, legacy technology, perhaps a little bit around culture, skills, dare I say it, budgets, and, you know, we're going to come on and, and discuss those in the in the course of the next hour, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to finish my bit by reiterating, you know, what I said, what I've already said, but practical terms, this is a journey. And you, you know, from data to analytics to insight. And for some organizations, that takes, you know, it's many stages over many years. But the key thing is to, to start on that journey. And that's what we see that most organizations are on that Brilliant. journey. Caroline, thank you so much. And as you say, lots of questions coming in, including you started with that, you know, people are talking now about kind of using AI and generative AI to help do some of this um, analysis. But as you say, that's a journey and maybe still a long way away for some people, but you need to start on that journey and do some of the foundational things around data first. You've brought in the importance of governance, having good governance in place. So that if you do need to move quickly and do some of this stuff, you're more confident that you can do it in a safe and secure way and in a, a fast way as well. COVID, I think, coming up, we've had that in previous webinars as well as a real kind of period where lots of things were done very well, very quickly out of necessity. But can we now have that as the kind of way that we work going forward as well. And then really good to hear in that research that you said some positives around people saying people are collabor collaborating on sharing data and they are using data to drive kind of policy making and decision making, but still lots of barriers in place, which absolutely will come on to. I can see in the questions coming in, lots of questions around some of the sticking points. Thanks, Caroline. And then over to you, Emma, and then we will come to the questions that are coming in. So Emma, over to you first. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, fantastic opportunity to be on such a strong panel. And there are definitely things that Sarah and Caroline have have talked about that I will I will try and reference um, as I work through what I was going to talk to you about today. So as per the intro, Emma Highland, um, I lead on data analysis and analytical briefing within the Illegal Migration Operations Command which really should be named, renamed because it is a mouthful every time I have to introduce myself. Um, essentially, what we are trying to do is to use data, MI, and to some of what Sarah was saying, modeling, um, while we are um, implementing the Illegal Migration Act, which is a massive sea change for the Home Office in terms of how we manage illegal migrants um, arriving in the UK and the processes that then follow. Um, providing situational awareness to seniors, um, really sort of reporting strategically on the overall health of the system. Um, and I think what's great about the way we're doing that is we are looking at it from a real end-to-end point of view. So rather than siloed processes, how is the entire system performing? And something that Sarah was talking about, that capacity and demand, and really being able to articulate how cases flow through a process, a very complex process, with a lot of dependencies, a lot of potential bottlenecks, and actually using the data and the modeling in particular to be able to drive efficiency through those processes. Um, and also then tactically for sort of workflow and decision making on a on a day to day basis. What I want to talk about this morning are two of the key challenges that I see for anyone who is leveraging the data coming out of their oper operational areas to do those activities that I've just described. But off the back of those two challenges, an opportunity, um, which I can I can sort of see evolving 
not just in the illegal migration space, it's something which will be true for many public sector organisations. The two barriers, <clears throat> excuse me, that I want to talk about, anybody working with data and using data and, and MI to drive decision making won't be surprised to hear me say data quality mm. is the first. Um, and then the other is, as Caroline alluded to, that legacy tech, that reliance on grey and shadow IT, non-standard data sources, anything which sits outside of an official system of record, which becomes a massive data asset um, to inform decision making and to help build that insight picture. <clears throat> the opportunity I want to talk about kind of comes out of those things. Um, it's around um, the department and stakeholders, ministers, really wanting to be data driven, actually helping to understand and articulate what that means. And that is those foundational building blocks. It's clearly articulating what those challenges are, but then using the fact that there is a desire to overcome those challenges to get to that point of being data driven truly. And the opportunity to leverage the current burning platform um, in order to make sure that we can put those foundational building blocks in place with longevity that will service other than the current building, building black, black burning platform and set us up for success in the future. On the first challenge then, so data quality. It sounds really obvious to say this, but MI outputs, visualizations, dashboards, the opportunity of AI, all of that stuff, the insights we derive from it, it's only as good as the data feeding in. And so that is a real challenge in terms of how to bring everybody who interacts with data, not just data professionals, everybody interacting with data to that place where data quality is of fundamental importance because of how that data is going to be used downstream. It needs a whole system approach bottom up, top down, coalescing and investment to buy in at all levels. Now, of course, there is a place for tactical remediation. If we find an, a, an area of poor data quality, a particular challenge, yes, of course, we should look to resolve that in terms of remediation. But actually, what we find ourselves doing through that is painting the fourth bridge, which is not going to set us up for the success that I spoke about. Actually, what we need to be doing is addressing the strategic root causes of poor data quality, and that's supporting frontline operational users to get things right. It's managing out the opportunities for data quality errors to occur. That's through technology. It's through empowerment, through guidance, through um, through guidance of how to use our systems of record. It's about a feedback loop. But if systems of record are not allowing people to get data quality right in the first instance, it's about improving those systems of record, validation, business rules, all those sorts of things that basically set up our frontline users to be able to achieve really high standards of data quality, get that foundational building block right. And all of those opportunities around visualizations, MI, really driving really evidence-based, truly evidence-based decisions flows from that. The other challenge that I don't want to speak about is that legacy IT, that reliance on, on tactical um, solutions for data collection and data management. A wise man once said to me, there's nothing so permanent as a tactical solution. And it's so, so, so true. Um, we rely on non-standard, we rely on the spreadsheet that somebody set up locally um, because there wasn't the capacity within our digital and data teams to build the system of record in a strategic way. And that comes with so many risks. Data quality, is, data quality risks are enhanced, the technical debt that you are left with as a result. And as I say, the proliferation of a tactical solution into a full-on strategic asset. Um, now, if you are in a brand new organization, if you were setting up from scratch, you know, needless to say, blank sheet of paper, you would 
have a fully integrated set of systems of record. You would have beautifully crafted data standards. You'd have validation throughout. Personally, I would put a cap on spreadsheet size. So, you know, you can have your car parking rotor, but something that's got loads of personal data and is being used as a formal data collation, feeding into MI, et cetera, that wouldn't be allowed. Sorry, those who love their spreadsheets. Um, I'm very happy to be shouted down on that one. But essentially, you would build something which enables everybody to be serviced through systems of record for the full BI and MI capabilities that they need. But we work for government departments and we have legacy grey and shadow IT. We have legacy local data sets. We have systems of record which um, haven't necessarily been designed for full integration. Um, for me, it's how you manage that balance. So in the immediate term, there is an, ur an urgent need for demand fulfillment. We have to work with what we've got, be cognizant of the risks and active on the mitigations. In the medium term, we should be looking for how we transition from the tactical solutions to the fully strategic. And in the long term, it's that fully embedded enterprise and data strategy, which everybody is brought up to. So the opportunity that I spoke about at the start, leverage the conversations that we're having now, leverage the fact that data is being discussed continually in governance fora, um, articulate the importance of those data foundations and through that, drive a culture of literacy, of understanding and empowering everybody to really use data as a strategic asset for the public good. Emma, thank you so much. I love the way that you started there by saying, um, as you say, that we have ministers, we have leaders at the moment who want to be data driven. You know, this is a conversation that they're having. So use that to kind of start these uh, conversations around, well, what are some of the barriers in place and how do we kind of overcome those? You've picked up on two which have already come out, I think, in our questions as well. So data quality and the legacy tech. And as you say, the insights will only be as good as the quality of the data that you put in. So absolutely crucial that we look at the quality of the data. And as you said, it has to be a whole system approach right down to the frontline users and, and trying to build out the possibilities of errors in the quality. And then on that legacy IT, this is something that comes up a lot in our events is how do people continue doing what they're doing while at the same time transitioning to the system that they ideally want to have? And it's that balancing act, I think, and not easy to do at all when it comes to the data issues. Thank you so much, Emma, and thank you to all of you for setting the scene so brilliantly. You really have got our audience going. We've got lots of questions coming on already. I'm going to start straight away back on that data quality one because you focused on that, Emma, in your last remarks there. And we had a question in from Devel Patel, who just simply said, how do we improve the quality of data capture? So um, I'm going to come back to Sarah and then Caroline and Emma, if you want to add anything else to what you said, feel free to do so afterwards. But Sarah, your thoughts, building on what Emma said on how do we improve the quality of the data and the quality of the way it's captured? So I think, and if I can come to kind of quite a high level, there's obviously like technical technical things that need to be in place. But I think fundamentally, one of the things we've observed and found in health over a long period of time is what gets used gets improved. So if, if the people who are collecting the data are using it, the outputs as well, and you have a feedback loop, you do tend to get an increase in that data quality. Really good example is this winter, our flu returns from the NHS were much more complete um, across hospital systems than they were the previous year. And some of that was because we had much better working relationships with the regional teams um, in the NHS who were sending out those requests. And so they could see the value of the data and we were getting um, more improved in. So I think that's a relatively old fashioned answer, but, but it's something that we've had experienced um, in health as being quite true. Thanks, Sarah. Caroline, your thoughts on this, improving the quality of the data and the way it's captured? I think, I mean, just, just reflecting on the on, on the discussions, I think I think there's a couple of things. I think some of it comes down to educating everybody that touches yeah. that data. I think Emma mentioned that. And, um, and perhaps with that, some empowerment around the role that people can play in, in, in doing and helping with that. And, and I think if there are, if there are examples or where there are examples of 
we've got really good data quality and this is how we're using it and this is the difference that we make then i think people see okay that that that's what i need to do i think there's a you know there's a role for you know i'm, I'm here from that there's a role for a technology but the, dare i say it, i think the technology is the easy part yeah the other part is is the people and, the, and and getting to that point of the the, the the culture around it makes such a difference to the the services that can be provided you know how quickly they can be provided how accurately and cost effectively they can yeah they can have quite often when we're talking about data issues it's not the technology that's the issue it's people and the culture it's, it's, yeah you're right there's some really cool technology out there um yeah. And I, and I think, sorry to cut over you, I think, you know, what we're starting to see actually where there are issues around data quality and data capture from a perhaps from a privacy point of view, that is one of the areas that generative AI can make a difference because this idea of actually can we use synthetic data in some places where we can test and prove that that synth synthetic data is, is as accurate and, and is representative of, of real data you know sometimes that, for me that's yeah. a, a use case that we're starting to see more more interest in thanks and emma did you want to add anything i noticed as you were speaking there a question came in anonymous saying agreed educating even the public too if they are involved in reporting on the importance of the quality of data yeah i think the only thing that i would add completely agree with everything that that caroline has just said i think when we're talking to technology people and trying to persuade and influence to do what they need to do in the data quality space, that tends to be quite a straightforward conversation. I think for me, to the original question, it is about the art of storytelling, actually. Mm. It's about how we tell the stories to people of why data quality is important, what the real life impacts are of getting it wrong. Um, and if we can communicate that in a non-data, non-techie way, I think that really helps to land the message and people then actually genuinely get the importance and are bought into to helping with with the overall improving picture. Thanks. Another quick, I'm going to come back in a moment to data sharing because we've got several questions on kind of data sharing, but staying on this um, issue of kind of the quality of data and how it's gathered and reported. Um, another question coming, should government mandate standards of data reporting? Should we have a code of practice? Um, for example, you know, the, the same format in which we report all of our data. Um, I'm going to change the order a little bit. So, Caroline, I'll come to you first on this one. Would that be helpful? I mean, in some respects, probably. But I, just, I guess I worry about how, not, how easy that would be to do, you know, because yeah, the changes that would need to happen to create those standards could could take would, would probably take decades right i think you know you know some some sectors have got that right from the offset um pharmaceutical companies have to report in a in a certain way when it comes to um you know drug submissions for new products they're trying to to bring to market but those those procedures have been set in place for many many years um and yet still occasionally they get they get they get challenged i think I mean, i think there are there's, there's progress being made in that space right aren't there with some some of the national data standards mm. etc around the presentation perhaps the, the reporting format i don't know it'd be interesting to see what the what the others think so. yeah sure well i'm going to come to sarah and emma and i'm going to add in because i think it's related the question from um adabisi who says would a centralized system to replace ad hoc spreadsheets i think this was um, this was in light of what you said, Emma, about spreadsheets. Um, would a centralised system to replace ad hoc spreadsheets in Outlook um, be better? So what, what software should we host the data on? Um, who would have permissions to add new data sets, exact, et cetera? So I think it's should there be a more standard kind of type of practice when it comes to reporting, gathering and, and keeping uh, your data? Sarah, I'll come to you and then to Emma. So I think... 
I think I'd agree a lot with some of Caroline's responses. And I, I think there already has been quite good work done centrally around data standards and expectations and digital standards. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that that's, that's where we develop from and we learn from those, particularly the digital community, um, about how they are reporting and collecting data and having consistent use of um different systems across so that we can speak to each other across government departments because I think that really helps with that as well um I do think on the centralized question I think it's a really good one I think I would say if we're approaching that from a government department so so is are we moving towards strong Kind of a strong central leadership of provision of technology that is really good for people to use so that we can start to move away from those spreadsheets so can we make it really easy for people to do that to have those enterprise solutions um and then i think working with the center of government to have advice and standards around what should we be looking for so we can be really good consumers of those products and technologies um i I'm not brave enough to pick the software, I'm afraid, and, and say what I what I would take a punt on. Um, but but I think those are the general those are the general principles I'd suggest. Thanks. Emma, back to you. Thanks, Siobhan. And yeah, what a fantastically complex question. Um so I think in terms of centralized standards, I think I, I completely agree with Caroline, it would be a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, there are certain data reference data sets that I know of that simply wouldn't be appropriate across different government departments. For example, there are things which in the migration and border space we need to capture as a nationality that passport office absolutely couldn't. Mm. Um, so I think that there are so many layers of complexity within it. But I do think that there is something around those data sets which can move to a centralized standard understanding how we might go about doing that it would be decades worth of work because if you think about how long it takes a government department to develop a system of record you wouldn't be able to retrofit those standards it would be a question of going forward and um, so I do I do think I think that the ambition is great and it comes back to my blank sheet of paper if mm. we could all start all over again we would absolutely do that as far as we could um but we are where we are um and I think on the, I, like Sarah, would not want to pick any software particularly. Um, I think the first step is for individual organizations to be looking, again, to Sarah's point, which I've written down because I think it's a great expression, what is used gets improved. If we can identify those spreadsheets, which are critical information assets within the organization, and just start putting in some plans for how we could maybe identify what data is being used from those and incorporate that into systems of record through enterprise. Um, and doing it kind of slowly but surely that way so that we can phase out those spreadsheets, but really starting with the most critical. Thanks. OK, I want to move on to data sharing, because this comes up a lot when we have any conversations around data and people's frustrations about how hard it is sometimes to share data across departments and agencies in the public sector. And I think there are three questions that have come in on this. So the first one was, how do we overcome the bureaucracy involved with data sharing? And um, there are lots of data sharing guidelines and agreements in place but sometimes the practice doesn't seem to match those. Then another question that came in was, how do we improve cross-organizational working to get better data insights and shared decisions? And then just now a question has come in and I'm gonna admit I'm, I, I'm not technical enough to fully understand this. So if, if, if you're not familiar with this, that's absolutely fine. But um, Adrian has said, in my department, DWP, we're moving towards event-driven architecture. This should greatly accelerate data sharing across the organisation. Is there any merit in having a wider government strategy for this, including the potential for cross-departmental event sharing? So I think all of these questions are around how can we improve data sharing across departments? And is it, I'm going to supplement, is it to do with guidance and laws and things that are in place or is this going back to Caroline's point is this more a cultural issue about people not being willing or not knowing how to share their data Emma I'll start with you on this one 
So I do think that there is a culture of fear almost around data sharing, actually. Um, and for me, the really simple answer to that is education, both in terms of what legal provisions there are around data sharing, but also around being able to really clearly articulate to each other what the cross-departmental benefit for the customer of the data share actually is. Because I think if you look at it from that angle, that helps to overcome that fear because you can see a real benefit both to the government department's concerns um, or ALBs, et cetera. You can see the real benefit to them, but the benefit to the customer, which I think is why that's where the fear comes from realistically, isn't it? That there will be public repercussions as a result, but if if you can clearly articulate the benefit to the customer of that data share, I think that massively helps. Um, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll defer to my other Thanks, panel. Emma. Yeah, Caroline, is this something that you come across a lot when you're working with different organisations in the public sector that they don't share their data as effectively or efficiently as you think they should be? I think we, we see some areas where there's really good, good, good progress. And I think that, that was like, yeah, there was, that, that's like the longest question ever, isn't it, in, in three parts. But I, I think some of the things that we see are, as the barriers, it's it's about, you know, sometimes it's a little bit about that legacy technology. It's hard, mm. right? And I think, you know, some of it is, okay, what is the, what is the plan to modernise that legacy mm. environment? Um, and I think, you know, what we're starting to see is that that piece where, you know, in some areas, there's a there's a move to, a, you know, cloud based solutions, cloud based architecture. You know, that that's a good time to say, you yeah, back to Sarah's point, what gets used got what is what gets improved. So, you know, nobody is taking a big bang approach. We pick up all this data, we put it in the cloud or we put it somewhere that means that anybody across government can share it because, but again, that's too big. That's too too scary. I think there's the, the sphere of that. Um, I think it's more about what's the what's the use case, what's the benefit, and getting people to Emma's point to understand the story. Why are we doing this, and what are we we trying to achieve? Um, we see that actually, without changing, taking us off off topic. What what I see and experience quite a bit is I see that around AI. People say we need. You know, people say we need to share more data we need to do ai and the first question is like that's brilliant what what for mm. what is the use case that you're thinking about what is the problem that you're trying to solve or the situation that you're trying to improve and what will be the benefit and then we can start to say okay now we understand that what is the what's the data that we need because when we talk about data sharing people you know in in, in my experience people think about Okay, gosh, we've got to open up that system and that database. Whereas actually, if it's if it's based on a use case and a problem, you can take a little bit more of like a slithered approach and say, let's solve this one, let's tell the story, let's share, share the benefits. And yeah. I just think the other thing about the barriers and it's been touched on is there's some cultural thing and there's some education pieces. Yeah. Thanks, Caroline. Sarah, your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I think my my perspective is I, I've always worked in health and, and always used health data. And obviously we have um, slightly different sensitivities than you you would necessarily, you, you need, and we need to have. So I suppose I would have quite a high, I want to have a lot of assurance and process around what I'm doing. Um, I want my team to have that guidance so that we can be sure that we are keeping the trust of the public in, in what we're doing and that we're really parsimonious about using personal information or medical information from individuals um and so i suppose those would be the principles that that we would always try to keep in mind in health and i suppose i'd reflect that the unsung heroes of this are like having a really uh collaborative and solutions focused team working in your data governance team that they are properly resourced and um, so that they can actually work with you to put the assurance in place because for a lot of these things while they're seen as barriers uh, and 
they are there to protect you and to protect the public. Um, and there is a way and a constructive way through often. And sometimes that is about making choices. So maybe you don't choose all the individual mm -hmm. level information that you might want to if you had a shopping cart. You reduce that down. You use aggregate data when you can do that. Um, and I, I think that I would kind of to, to stand up for our data governance colleagues. I think they're incredibly helpful um, of bringing you through that process. Mm -hmm. And I've always found that really valuable. Um, and I, I think then that keeps us on the right side of the, of the trust of the public. Um, so th that would be kind of my my slight my take on it and would agree with the other points from Caroline and Emma too. Thanks. And building on that issue then of trust, I guess, trust and privity, privacy and security of kind of data and information. Two questions again. One is, do you think GDPR laws are a barrier to data sharing? Um, and the second question was, what's your take on the data protection and digital information bill, which my understanding is, is also about kind of access to uh, individual data, kind of people's data. So you can answer one or both of those because I think they're connected. But the GDPR issue definitely comes up when we have conversations about data in that the sense is that some officials it's a bit, they're a bit confused about what data they can and can't share and whether they're going to get in trouble sharing data. So, um, Sarah, I'll start with you on this one. Your thoughts on GDPR and, and the bill, if you want to give an answer on that as well. Yeah, I, I think my take on it would be that I, I actually I can't think of a project where we haven't managed to get the impact we need within the current structures, provided we have that good advice and that's properly resourced. Um, and and so I, I mean I, I I wouldn't pretend to be an expert on either of those. Um, but I, I would say that actually, yes, I'm sure there are circumstances where it has been a barrier, but for me, um, I haven't experienced that. But I I, I would accept that I do think there is confusion mm -hmm. and sometimes um it is the interpretation of those rules is not consistent across different departments or teams. And I think that is where perhaps colleagues have particular mm -hmm. frustrations is a lack of consistency of interpretation and um, where that doesn't seem to be reasonable or proportionate. Thanks, Sarah. And Emma, you're nodding there. Do you think it's more than a perception of these, uh, the regulation that's in place rather than they actually are a barrier to sharing data? Yeah, so I'm going to shout out an unsung hero on this one as well. And that is our data protection practitioners, the Office of the Data Protection Officer, um, officer who understands the nitty gritty wireframing of GDPR and the bill. Um, and I think it is a question of, of leaning in on their expertise. I think Sarah's absolutely right that there is an inconsistency of understanding. I don't think that the GDPR and the bill are in and of themselves blockers or barriers. Um, I think it is the interpretation, it's the fear of them. And so my advice to anybody um, who sort of feels that they are struggling in this space, unlock the knowledge and expertise of the data protection experts within the organization because they will absolutely help to cut through what appears to be bureaucratic mm -hmm. blockers. Um, and in turn give you the confidence to then sort of acknowledge that you have considered due diligence on all of the legal provisions and the guidance is to carry on in such a way. And so, yeah, and some heroes lean in on them. Thanks, Emma. Caroline, you can answer that one, but I do want to move on because you mentioned AI. So I also want to move on to AI. So um, the question I want to put to you is... Um, how hard is it to access and utilize different data from different sources? And do you leverage AI in doing that? So essentially the extent to which you use AI, um, I'm quite interested in, because you mentioned that in your opening comments, but you can, if you like as well, um, answer the question about the regulation in place and is that a barrier? But I'm coming to you. <laughs> I mean, they are linked, right, aren't they? And I think, you know, often when we are working with clients on AI projects, obviously they need data and depending on the, the the use case depends on whether there are privacy gdpr considerations i think sometimes that perhaps there is a cultural thing about hiding behind um hiding behind perhaps the confusion mm. i think we emma was just touching on that it's not sometimes people don't well, what can we share what can't we share mm. what can we 
make available and I think you know you talked about your data protection team I think what we find is actually engaging with sort of information security teams within an organization is a because that that's their job right they understand it and then that can help cut through some of the um some of the bureaucracy and some of the the barriers say okay this is what we can and can't do now what what progress can we make in in other areas and i think that so so obviously you need data for ai type use cases where you're using you know sophisticated machine learning techniques i think the question was also saying was also asking about using ai to get to the data mm. for, for use cases and i think that's where some of the these things around kind of generative ai we're, we're starting to see those those use cases where perhaps um departments have got data sets let's talk about it in that context that they don't feel that they can share the data but they can share the structure the nuances the patterns in the data and then you can use ai or generative ai to replicate a synthetic version of that data and i think that's a you know that's a brilliant use case either you know particularly when it comes to actually we need to identify patterns and and trends perhaps you know an example where it's not about individual people it's about you know yeah. take some of the things that sarah was talking about around you know what 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 winter illnesses are we going to see peak, peaks in yeah. um, does, does that uh, yeah I, I brilliant like this for hours but i was <laughs> <laughs> Thank, and we have got other questions coming in so thanks and Sarah there was a question that came in I think which is while you were talking in your uh, original presentation and this was around um, how to ensure the data we're using can generate an accurate forecast so you were talking about forecasting what do you do if you know there's some data missing that you would really want how do you acquire that missing data and where do you look for it so this is I think a question which all of you could probably answer but I'm going to start with Sarah is where do you go if you know you need a bit more data how do you even start that process yeah so it's a really really nice one from William um so I suppose the first thing is that you for something like a, a model where you're you're using it to forecast is that you want to be it's obvious but you want to be testing whether your forecast is accurate enough or, or not and so there's a very big testing process um as part of that as part of the development and you'll also want to be um we are the way that we develop them we're quite agnostic around leading indicators so what goes in is what makes it it, it accurate and there's quite a large process and then related to that question around getting streams of data that takes a lot of time and i, I consider that part of our model development process is getting the data, getting the agreements in place that you need. Um, then if there are situations where, for example, your missingness is to do with, um, say, for example, in our case, a particular region or a particular hospital isn't reporting any given week, every single week when you're getting the data in and in your processing, you need to have a way to adjust for that appropriately and in a way that is, um, uh, that is, is in your it's not affecting uh, the accuracy of your forecast insofar as it, it, you can do that. I think then sometimes you also have to recognize when you might need to say pull something um, or, inter you know, so for example, if a particular region suddenly adds a lot of data that it wasn't before, that you're interpreting that correctly rather than saying, oh gosh, well that's spiking up and it's no, yeah. it's just, they've, they've switched on um, their system. So um that's a I, I think it's having all those components in place as part of your system um, throughout the season and throughout that ch value chain that I was talking yeah. about. Thanks, Sarah. Emma, did you want to add anything on this? Where do you go to if you want more data? How do you how do you kind of look for that and how do you access it? So for me, this so data is a golden thread running through everything that we do, right? And so for me, and Sarah spoke to this in terms of um, having the model, models and kind of assessing them, I think it's really, really important that all of your data capabilities and your analytical capabilities are as joined up as the data that's flowing through them. So it's about bringing together knowledge and understanding of the people doing the very technical and scientific modeling processes with those people who are then 
inputting the the actuals and understanding and looking at what the actuals are doing and i think if you have that really kind of coalesced vision mission not sure quite what the right word is but if you are all within the data capabilities community coalescing around the same outcomes um then that that massively helps yeah thanks emma um, Marguerite has asked a question. I really like this one because, again, it's one of the barriers. I think she said is one of the problems with data sharing, the fact that people have given consent for specific processing by a certain organisation only. So is there a different way we could be looking at when we gather data, the consent that is that people give to how that data can be used? Um, Caroline, I'll come to you for your thoughts on this, then Sarah, then Emma. I mean, I mean, I guess yes is the obvious thing that it, it it can be, it can be a barrier, and I think it's that. Just going back to Emma's point, it's that I like that expression, golden, golden thread. If you've got a problem that you need to solve or a decision that you need to make, you could only make it if you've got the data and you've got the right mm. to use it. And I think, you know, and perhaps I'm not quite answering this question, but I think what what I've seen from my experience is sometimes you have to you have to start by reframing the question because otherwise you can't get out if you can't get to the data and use the data that you need you're mm. there's, there's nowhere to go so there is a little bit of okay how do we reframe the question based on the data that we do have and try and answer that try and answer that question question first I think we we have seen that um with a number of the organizations departments that, that that we've worked with where we've kind of gone right let's 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 start but just change the focus slightly while some of those th th those other considerations yeah um are taking place and i think the really good thing about that is if you if you close the loop and you share what's happened then that's where you can start to deal with some of these collaboration and buy-in issues so that you get people going right we now understand what we're yeah, trying yeah. to achieve and what the benefit the benefit is and I yeah. think sorry last thing I think you know uh, I mentioned at the start I've spent quite a long time working in the commercial sector and I think that's where there are some real learnings you know mm. commercial sector is entirely driven on that closed back loop where mm. you know be it a telco or a bank where um, we're making a message we're making a communication to a consumer to a customer and we need to know whether it's landing, mm. is, is it effective, closing the loop so that we can refine and relearn. And sometimes that refinement is to improve this, we need more data. And then that yeah. goes back. Right. Emma and then Sarah, your thoughts on consent and the consent that we ask for when people are sharing their data with with government. So, again, I, I would come back to that that point I made earlier around having a open conversation with your data protection practitioners and and the office of the data protection office because the privacy notices um are very carefully constructed for very good reason to be legally compliant but there is also a logistical operational consideration when when those are written um so i think relying on those people who understands exactly what the privacy notices are permitting and not permitting within legislative frameworks, I think unlocks a lot of what people see as a challenge and blocker around them. Thanks. Sarah. Thanks. Yeah, I think I, I thought Caroline made a really good point on this, which was um when something isn't available, and in this situation it's not. You know, so so if we can't legally do it, we can't. Um, <laughs> But that shouldn't be an enemy of doing anything. And I think sometimes as data professionals, we can be a bit hung up on the data that would theoretically be available if everything was perfect and we, if we had access to everything. Actually, we should, as analysts, um, be able to still do something useful with what we have, even if it isn't everything. And that maybe then will provide the motivation and the use case to go back and do it properly if we really can make the case that we do need to increase the permissions. But that always has to be done um, uh, like legally and through the, the, the proper channels. Um, so I think, I think I'd yeah emphasise the, the art of the possible is always what we should be aiming for. 
Thanks, Sarah. Um, we are coming to the end of our time. I can't believe how quickly you've answered so many questions, all of you. Um, I think the final question I think we've already answered, that was about GDPR and kind of data sharing. I think we have covered that. So the very final question I want to put to the three of you, and this came up, I think, Emma, you had this in your opening remarks about how you can use the fact that ministers and, and leaders um, want to be data kind of informed in their decision making. So my final question to all of you is, You've mentioned kind of going to experts where people have particular questions about data and how data can be used. But how do we make sure that all officials, even if they're not technology experts themselves, understand the value of data in whichever area they're working in? How do we kind of make sure that all professions across the public sector and the civil service understand that? Um, I will go Sarah, Caroline, and then Emma. Sarah, to you. I think... Um... I think one I think one aspect for me that's really important in this question is that we're making sure we are providing data products and insights that's making it really easy for all of those people to do their jobs. And um, so we are not asking them to be data professionals. And if that's the minister or the secretary of state or it's somebody who is a colleague who's working on an operational service that as data professionals, we are making their life easy and showing the value of the data um, with the products that we're producing for them and hopefully that will tell its own story and get its own support if, if we wave the flag and, and shout loudly. Thanks Sarah. Caroline your thoughts on this? I feel I might steal Emma's line here <laughs> do, but I really think this is about telling stories it's not about technology I think all too often you know sometimes you can see it's just like, like you're talking to people about the technology and that that's just an enabler if you tell the story of 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 the what and the why and the outcome that it will deliver that that's what resonates particularly because typically we're talking about things that impact people and you're talking to people <laughs> about how it might impact them or or other other people and I think I think that's key I think there's a whole probably separate conversation that we can have about skills and where do you educate people the work that yeah. can be done in schools universities etc but I think that's probably for another for another webinar a whole nother webinar we will do on that <laughs> thanks caroline and emma final thoughts to you um yeah storytelling 100 percent um it's about finding the use cases that matter to people even if they don't actually understand that it is a data thing yeah. use your expertise to be able to articulate how data plays into those day-to-day real life events um, and tailor those use cases to the specific seniors that you're engaging with and do it in a storytelling methodology. You know, do it with real life examples, day-to-day -day speak. Um, and I think that is, that's the strongest way really to land the message. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Uh, brilliant conversations, fantastic questions from the audience. So thank you very much to the audience for sending in all those questions. But a huge thanks from me to Caroline, to Sarah and to Emma. I think that note on which to end there is um, a really, really good one, a positive one in that, you know, data, using data in this way can have huge benefits. And actually, you don't need to really worry about the technology if that's not your area, but understanding how you can use data to improve your own services or the services you deliver to the public um, in that way, really fantastic. Um, thank you to our knowledge partner, SAS, uh, for being part of this. Just to say to the audience who are here and everyone who's registered, um, we will be sending you a questionnaire, if you wouldn't mind taking a couple of minutes just to fill that in for us, because it means that we can keep giving you the webinars that are of most use to you and the topics that you really want to hear about. So I'd be hugely grateful if you could do that for us. We will also be sending to you a, a link with this video. So you can watch it all again if you miss parts of it, or you can share it with your colleagues as well. Um, and in a couple of weeks time, we'll publish an article covering all of the key issues that were raised in this discussion as well. And then finally, you will see on the screen there. So this webinar really is one of a, a series of things that we are doing running up to the event in autumn, which is on the 19th of September, which is all about um, using data in the public service so public service data live um, if you are interested in going to that it was fantastic last year the first one of these um, you can register your interest there and register at the link there and all the details are on the global government forum uh, website but that just leaves me again to say a huge thank you to our panel you answered
answered so many questions there. I think it's one of the webinars where we've had the most questions that you've got through in the time that we had. So thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all again at another one of our webinars very soon, I hope. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy the sunshine. Thanks a lot.